Brothers and sisters, aloha. Welcome to today's devotional. It's always a great sight to see you come in and gather for these weekly spiritual meetings. We recognize those seated on the stand today. I'm joined by, by my wife, Sister Susan Tanner. Our speaker, Brother Viliami Tolutau, and his wife, Sheila Tolutau, and their daughter, Savannah Aupiu, who will introduce her father. Representatives from our stake presidencies are on the stand with us today. Uh, from our married student stake president, Steve Tuller, from our YSA first stake president, Marifihimiu Tupuivaha, and from our YSA second stake president, Billy Casey Jr. We also recognize President Alfred Grace from the Polynesian Cultural Center, who's with us today, as well as members of the vice presidents from the President's Council and members of the Student Association leadership team. Next Tuesday, the devotional speaker will be Don Akana, uh, an assistant professor of exercise and sports science. Our opening hymn today will be High on a Mountain Top, hymn number five. And our chorister this morning is Satur Satoru Honda, uh, an organist, Jennifer Durden. Following the opening hymn, the invocation will be offered by Wing To San, also known as Olivia, a senior from Hong Kong majoring in social work. Olivia served in the California, Oakland, San Francisco mission. We'll then hear a scripture which has been chosen and will be read by Aria Utley. Uh, Arila is a freshman from Salem, Oregon, majoring in psychology. She served in the Peru Trujillo mission. Following the scripture, we'll be favored with a, music, by, uh, with a musical number, Hosanna, from the Lamb of God, which will be directed by Michael Belknap and sung by our BYU Hawaii Concert Choir, along with Stacy McCary, who will be accompanying them on the piano. And now our opening hymn, High on a Mountaintop. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for we can come here today to the devotional today. We're grateful for we have this opportunity to um, be here in BYU Hawaii. We pray that thou bless us and to guide us, that we'll have thy spirit with us. Also, please bless the speaker that we'll be able to bring the message um, that we need to listen. Also, pray that thou bless us to have open mind and open hearts 
that we'll be able to receive the message. And we love you so much, and we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. Behold, I will show unto the Gentiles their weakness, and I will show unto them that faith, hope, and charity bringeth unto me the fountain of all righteousness, Ether 12, 27, and 28.
Thank you, concert choir, for that beautiful musical testimony and that uh, lifts us and invites the Spirit to be with us today. Today's devotional speaker is Hiliami Tolutau, an associate professor of sculpting and art at the university. Following Brother Tolutau's devotional message, the benediction will be offered by Isaac Cabrera, a sophomore from Tagum City, Philippines, majoring in information technology. Uh, Isaac Carl served in the Philippines Tacloban mission. And now Sister Alpiu. Brothers and sisters, aloha. I am grateful for this opportunity to introduce my father, who many of you know as Viliami Tolutau. Viliami, however, isn't actually his name. His real name is Asipeli Havea Tolutau. He wasn't actually born on October 6, 1954, as his birth certificate claims either. His family now thinks he was born sometime in January, a few years earlier. That's the way it was in Tonga those days, filling out the paperwork for a birth certificate by illiterate parents out, of, out in the country after a home birth for their 13th child was not top priority. So when, it was my, so when it was time for my father to go to school, his birth certificate was guessed, at best, was guessed at best as could be remembered at the time. So while my dad likes to remind us every year that we are celebrating his birthday on the wrong day and that he is actually older than the amount of candles that we put on the cake, my mom is determined to keep it that way because she wants to believe that my dad is younger than he actually is. My grandfather, Viliami, died when my father was only five years old. He was then raised by his mother and his eldest brother, Tevita, who was actually old enough to be his father. In high school, my father adopted the name Viliami out of respect for and to honor the memory of his father. Growing up in a family of 13 children with no father was difficult, and much of my father's character was formed, and his ability to work hard was due to the challenges, challenges of his childhood in the islands. He was the only one of his 12 siblings to graduate from high school and then college. He came here to BYU with no money and an empty suitcase because he owned nothing to put in it. Thankfully, he was able to finance his education by working at the Polynesian Cultural Center. His fancy dance moves at the night show eventually won my mom over as well. He graduated from BYU, BYU Hawaii with a degree in fine art and then a master's degree in sculpture from BYU Provo. I was born while he was in his graduate program at BYU and like to think that my birth inspired his first major sculpture project of, the, of King Taufahau IV, the reigning king of Tonga at the time. For that reason, my birth is the only one I will mention, as my five other siblings would all agree it was the only one of major importance. <laughs> After graduate school, he moved to Alaska where my father taught at Wasilla High. While it was a good experience, an island boy could only handle the cold for three years. He also had a deep yearning to return to the islands to serve his people. So, he, so we moved to Tonga, where he and my mother taught at Liohana High School for five years. In 1991, he accepted a job to do sculpture at BYU Hawaii and has been teaching here ever since. My dad is a gifted artist, and while I've grown up watching him produce countless masterpieces, I am still amazed at what he can create with his hands. He is a man of vision. He sees things that most people cannot see. He is not easily swayed by the opinions of, of others or cares to follow the crowd. He walks to the beat of his own drum. When he creates art, he doesn't do it for the sake of earning money or for the praises of others. He does it as a way of expressing himself. He is a true artist in every sense of the word who is driven by his own passions and by what inspires him. My father is also a deep, a deep thinker and very philosophical. Nothing is just on the surface for him, but he thinks deeply and enjoys having meaningful conversations. Friends and family know that when they come to visit, it, it, it will not be for 10 minutes, but know they must set aside at least an hour or two. 
My dad may appear quiet and reserved, but he loves to talk, and like most Tongans I know, has no sense of time. When he has an idea or a thought that he wants to get off his chest, he cannot move on with life until he does so. Growing up, it was not uncommon for him to come into my room at the middle of the night and tap my foot. He'd always ask, are you awake? To which I would grudgingly reply, no. Ignoring my response, he'd sit down on my bed and begin to talk about life, school, and his concerns for me and my future as if it were in the middle of the afternoon. I always hated those conversations, but now cherish them as precious memories. Now that I am married and have a family, he no longer does this because we now lock our front door. <laughs> My mom is now, or always has been, the victim of these late night, early morning conversations. Aside from art and being a late night conversationalist, my dad is, is also, or also has become a great historian. He has a deep love and devotion for his country and has a great interest in the early Tongan history, more specifically the LDS church uh, history in Tonga. Well, when he's not doing sculpture, he's reading and studying the lives of early missionaries from journals he has collected over the years. His knowledge of Tongan history is expansive and many come to him wanting to learn more about their family history. While my dad has a terrible short-term memory and forgets his keys and phone on a daily basis, his ability to remember dates, names, and long-term events in history are quite remarkable. During my graduate school years, I often referred to him as my walking, talking Tongan library. It was his devotion to the LDS Tongan church history that sparked my interest and encouraged me to pursue a graduate degree in history. I am grateful for my father and for what he stands for. His example has taught me to think independent of the crowd and to stand firm in my beliefs. Though none of us kids were blessed with my dad's artistic skills, I hope my son will carry on this great legacy that my dad continues to create. Brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. You know, before I give my talk, I think of uh, those of you who graduated from college. I feel the same way. Ever since I was asked to give this talk, I look forward to today to be my graduation day. I'll be able to pass that line. My brothers and sisters, it is my assignment to speak to you and your assignment to listen. My goal is to finish my assignment before you finish yours. <laughs> I'll do my best. This, of course, is quoted from Ella M. Russell Pallet. Great introduction in his talk in the last April General Conference. And it really applies to me today. Before coming to Hawaii 43 years ago, I was asked a tough question, a question I have thought about for many years. What will be your major field of study? The person who asked the question really didn't know me well. His name was Samuel, my second to the oldest brother. I must admit that this brother was strict and bossy. He enjoyed being that way, and we all feared him. Being the youngest in the family, he and I were always on the opposite end of things. He didn't seem to agree with me on anything. When he asked me the question, I cringed, since I had a premonition of what his reaction would be. I told him I wanted to be major in art. As predicted, he countered and said, you don't have to go to America to study art. You can do that in our backyard. I smiled without saying a word. Brothers and sisters, I returned to Tonga in 1983 from BYU Graduate School, not only for the dedication of the Tongan temple, but to unveil the sculpture of the Tongan king. I want to confirm to 
to my brother, some of you, that the answer I gave him 10 years earlier was based on the prompting I had while on my mission. It was my dream to be a sculptor. You're seeing the end results of that dream. However, the process didn't come easy. Creating the sculpture of the King of Tonga while I was in graduate school at, in BYU had its setbacks. I used two inch pipes for the amateur and I heated them with a torch to bend the pipes. This was done before applying the 30,000 pound of clay. I spent months working on the statue based on pictures that were sent for the project. One morning I went into the sculpture studio and found the 11 foot statue collapsed on the floor. Obviously the heating of the pipes weakened the metal and the amateur was not strong enough to support the sculpture that would be. My professor asked me what I was going to do and I simply told him that I was going to start over again. Everyone thought that I was going to quit give up. Within two weeks, the whole sculpture was up again. There is another story of a young artist who repeatedly tried a business despite a rejection from his father. He made three attempts to start a company with his talent as a cartoonist. But each time, his company ended in bankruptcy. He couldn't pay his employees and everyone abandoned the business. There was no one else left in the office to talk to and he started to feel discouraged. While contemplating his plight, he pulled out a small pet from his pocket, a mouse. He let it run across the desk and pick it up every now and then. Finally, an idea dawned on, his, on him. He decided that he would start a new company with a little mouse as his partner. He shared the idea with his wife of the mouse being the new character. His wife was thrilled and supportive. She suggested to him, to her husband, that they should name the mouse Mickey. This is the story of Walt Disney, who in the 20s took his talent very seriously. He was ready to face the trials since he was prepared to fail and try again, was his motto. With the same commitment, he tried for the fourth time. This last time the company survived and from, the found, from this foundation came what is known as Disney with Mickey Mouse as his main character. For behold, the spirit of Christ is given to every man that he may know good from evil. Wherefore, I show unto you the way to judge. For everything he invited to do good and to persuade to believe in Christ is sent forth by the power and the gift of Christ. Wherefore, ye may know with perfect knowledge, it is of God." End of quote. Moroni 7.16. President Henry P. Eyring spoke of this subject in the past April General Conference. He emphasizes in his talk that every brother and sister is born enlightened by a portion of God's light. I quote, but we were not sent here completely in the dark. Each of us was given a portion of God's light called the light of Christ to help us distinguish between good and evil, right and wrong. Therefore, even those who live with little or no knowledge of Father's plan can still sense in their hearts that certain actions are just and moral while others are not." End of quote. What is it that inspires a person to do good? According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, conscience is an aptitude, faculty, intuition, or judgment that assists in distinguishing right from wrong. The inner sense of what is right or wrong in one's contact or motives impel one toward right action. The complex of ethical and moral principles that controls or inhibits the actions or thoughts of an individual, end of quote. The following, to follow the dictation of your conscience is one of the biggest challenges of life. Doing 
doing so leave you feeling insecure and lonely, especially when people do not see your perspective. Some of the greatest musicians, scientists, mathematicians, philosophers, and prophets secluded themselves and were very lonely. I have a personal testimony that a portion of God's light, the light of Christ, is within everyone, including you and me. Knowing that we have within us this God-given gift, the conscience, is a confirmation that we are sons and daughters of God. Regardless of who you are, what you are, you are special in the eyes of God. The question is left here for you to answer. How serious do you take that honor, that abortion of God's light, the light of Christ, is within you? Do you believe and have faith that you have that intelligence, power, and free agency to live your life the way you choose as son and daughter of God? What about the talent that is bestowed upon you? Do you take it seriously? Or is it like the seed that the sower dropped on the side of the road? That which is of God is light, and he that rece receiveth light continued in God, receiveth more light, and that light groweth bigger, brighter, and brighter until the perfect day. Doctrine and Covenant, section 5024. It is important that we have confidence in venturing out to create great things. Sometimes we lose confidence of our capability, especially when we compare our weaknesses with other neighbors' strength. That's when we find ourselves stuck in the mud, simply because we are afraid to risk the unknown, to go beyond the reef and out of our comfort zone. Knowing that we have a portion of God's light in it within us, we should look up and strive to reach out beyond our limit. With faith in God and in our potential, we should seek to reach higher. While teaching in Alaska, I had an Eskimo student who was completely blind. She came to class with the intention to learn how to do sculpture. I must admit that I doubted that this girl could do any sculpture. With my, in my class. She looked like a living ghost when I first saw her. I witnessed that she had empty eye sockets where eyeballs should have been. She was born blind and without sight. She was escorted to class by a trained dog as her guide. How could she handle the art activities in class, I wondered. To my amazement, she pulled out from her school bag sculptures that she created at home. They were sculptures of animals, a dog, a horse, and a cat. They were individually executed with proportion and details beyond belief. I stood there dumbfounded and asked myself this question. Am I the teacher or was I there to be taught by this amazing student? Who is, who is the handicap here? I ask myself, is it the student who totally blind with no eyes, or the ones with beautiful eyes but cannot see? Wherefore, I beseech of you, brethren, that ye should search diligently in the light of Christ, that he may know good from evil. And if ye lay hold upon every good thing and contemn it not, ye certainly will be a child of God. Moroni 7, 19. While serving my mission in Hapai in 1972, my companion and I were requested by the zone leaders to meet them on the island of Tungua. To fulfill this task, we were asked to assist a sea captain, Shola A, in navigating his boat from Nomuka to Tungua a distance of 50 miles. The weather that day was rough and the wind was strong. That made things worse. To make things worse, we were sailing against the wind. My companion and I took pride in preaching the gospel as missionaries, but not as 
in sailing as boat sailors. We were often seasick while sailing, especially when the water was choppy. What happened, what added to our dilemma as inexperienced sailors was the natural language used by impatient sea captain. Foul words from his mouth were sandwiched between every sentence. We were shocked at first and confused, not knowing what direction to follow, as his orders were not always clear. We either reached and did the right thing late or promptly doing the wrong thing. We could never win. We didn't do anything right. We could tell that from the every amount of words, foul words that spew out of the captain's mouth and splatter in our direction. As we approached the island of Tungua, we noticed that a small island was surrounded by reefs. It was low tide, and we had to look for the channel, the only entrance into the lagoon. The water in the channel was shallow, and the flow of the currents was coming strong, coming out strong. The danger of this feat was that the submerged rocks, which were slightly below the water surface, the sea captain had to be at the bow of the sailboat to look out for these deadly rocks, and someone had to be at the back of, to handle the rudder. Unfortunately, there was no one to help him but the two inexperienced elders. I was given the assignment and some strict instructions to follow precisely and inst instantly. The captain looked sternly in my face and said, I quote, I will only say two words from the front, tawala and lave. Tawala to steer the boat toward the wind, and lave to steer it away from the wind. In tawala, you have to pull in the sail and simultaneously steer the boat towards the wind. And if I call for lave, you must slowly release the rope of the sail and then steer the boat slowly away from the wind." End of quote. I took pride in my mathematic skills, and I thought to myself, that is was a very simple formula to follow. At one point, the captain yelled out, Tawala. I obediently pulled in the sail and steered the boat towards the wind as instructed. However, a few seconds later, he yelled out again, Tawala Malohi, a little bit more. <clears throat> At this point, I wish I had three hands. For one hand was busy with the rudder, the other was fast stretched, holding the rope with his tail. I was desperate, not knowing what to do. The only thought came to my mind was to use my teeth to hold the rope temporarily while I free my hand to pull in the sail a little bit more as requested. Luckily, we made it safely into the lagoon. The captain shook his head with a big sarcastic grin on his face. I was perplexed and thought for sure that I had done something wrong. However, to my surprise, I didn't hear any foul words. It was a miracle. I made a mistake. It was met with a smile. That's when he said, I never had any captain who maneuvered the sailboat the way you did. Holding the rope with your teeth was not wise. If there had been a sudden chalk on the chalk on the sail, you might have been knocked out. At least you could have lost all your teeth. End of quote. The captain later shared with me the greatest lesson I ever learned in my life, in my mission. He said, remember, if the boat is not moving, there's no use to reach for the rudder. Therefore, you must let go of it and use both hands to pull in the sail. And when the boat starts to move, then you slowly reach for the rudder. Verily, I say, and I, I say, men should be anxiously engaged in good cause, too many things in their own free will, and bring to pass much righteousness, for the power is in them 
wherein they are agent in the, unto themselves. And it's as much as men do good, they shall no wise lose their reward. Doctrine and Covenant 58, 27 to 28. As a teacher, I often wonder if students realize the commitment to work hard precedes every, everything else. It is a personal commitment to put your shoulder to the wheel and push along with all your might, mind, and strength if you expect miracles. Such like the blind girl, you can perform miracles in your life if you give it your all. It takes more effort to push a flat wheel barrel than it does one with air in the wheels. Don't let your wheels become flat. It takes only a finger to hold a kite in flight or steer a boat that is full motion. Brothers and sisters, we need to pray about our direction and then move forward without letting anyone stop you. When I was ready to attend high school over 50 years ago, my mom and I went out to our family farm to get a fragrant plant. Roots, seeds, flowers, and leaves to make tongan oil. The Sunday day was very hot. Scavenging for these ingredients was hard. I was not enthusiastic about crawling on my knees through the shrubs and bushes looking for these plants. At one point, I started to murmur with every step, complaining about everything. <clears throat> I, was, I wasn't sure whether it was, a worthwhile, was worthwhile to spend so much time in laborious activity, considering other things could be done. My rationale was that a bar of oil could be bought in a marketplace for 10 cents, and it would be a lot less hassle. Getting fed up with my constant nagging, my mother threw the woman basket. <laughs> the basket on the ground and stood quietly for a moment. Then she looked straight at me and slowly said, son, Someday, you understand the things that I worry about. If you go to school without a shirt on your back, people will simply say that you are poor. But if your skin is scaly and dry, your hair is not freshly covered with oil, then people will say, You don't have a mother. Son, it's okay to be poor, but it's a shame for my children to be in public with dry skin and wild hair that is not well groomed when their mother is still alive, of course. I learned to be respectful of those older than me. She taught me that others may have more experience, wisdom to share, and I would be better off listening than complaining. My skeptical, skeptical attitude got me nowhere, only to hurt my mother's feeling. In 1806, the British ship Port au Prince was ambushed in Tonga by a high chief named Finau. Upon seeing the guns on the ship, the chief figured that he could utilize them to assist with the civil war that was going on in Tonga. He quickly captured the ship, murdered the captain and almost all the sailors except a few. One of those saved was a captain, a cabin boy named William Marina, who he now adopted as his son. Marina in 16 became the first European to document accurate details of the civil wars in Tonga in the 1800s. Months later, it was brought to Finau's attention that William Marina was accused of writing a letter to any sea captains who might come to the island seeking revenge for the ambush of the Port of Prince. Finau, of course, was perturbed by this story and demanded that this letter be delivered and read to him. After listening to the interpretation of the letter, his anger was calmed. He showed compassion for the young cabin boy and claimed that this was a letter from a longing young man who was homesick for his mother and his homeland, England. 
Because Tonga had no written language before then, Fina was amazed with everything he heard from translation came out of a piece of paper. He reached out and grabbed the paper, turning it up and back and forth, upside down, and while shaking, he said slowly from side to side and said, and asked, can you put me in the paper? It was then Marina turned it and wrote F-I-N-A-U on the back of the paper. Of course, the chief could not testify the writing and he couldn't comprehend the chicken scratch. Another Englishman was called forth by the chief and instructed to read it. The sailor read, Fee Now. Chief Fee Now crept, again grabbed the paper, looked firmly at it and asked, where are my legs? After the translation was explained to satisfy the curiosity of the chief, he now thought that the reader must have known what the writer wrote prior to reading it. It was then Finau thought he played a little trick and whispered another name and had the reader loudly announce it before the rest of the group. Finau, the fearsome among the warriors, finally realized that the captain boy was the mightier warrior since he had mana magic of reading and writing. The chief was astonished when he told the boy that a person in the far when he was told that a person in faraway Britain could read and understand everything that was translated to him. It was then Finau pleaded with Marina, please, when you return to Polata'ane or Britain, send for me. To learn the mana. Education is critical. Learn all the magic you can while at this university. And when you have finished the translation of the prophets, you shall from thenceforth preside over the affairs of the church and the school, and set in order the church, churches, and study and learn, and become acquainted with good books and with languages, tongues, and people. Revelation given to Joseph Smith, Doctrine and Covenants, 19, 13, and 15. How we can become sensitive to other people and their cultures if we don't understand them? It is great to be in an institution like BYU Hawaii and PCC, where we can mingle and learn about each other's cultures. The church is not a local church as it was in New York, Missouri, and Illinois. Before the church spread to, to the West, it was in the Pacific already. When Elder Brigham Young Smoot and Harvard uh, John Padilla of Salt Lake first arrived in Tonga in 1891, they had their moment of exile as the saints, as the saints of the pioneer tracking west. Tonga at this time was heavily engaged in religious and political upheaval. King Dubal I was the leader of the Free Church of Tonga, and Tungi, the minister of the land, was the leader of the Wesleyan Church. They were both heavily engaged in competing for membership enrollment in their individual churches. When the two young Mormon elders arrived, Tonga was prejudiced against them. Law was passed prohibiting Tongans from hosting foreigners in their homes. The penalty was $500. The government was not enthusiastic, enthusiastic to give TL's missionaries a permit to lease land although Germans and English merchants were allowed to. The elder thought this was totally unfair. Life was very tough in Tonga for these missionaries because of the law, in addition to the language barrier. The missionary finally found out an apartment an English merchant of an English merchant situated in the middle of Nogalofa. They took their luggage into the back room and immediately set up their living room for cottage meetings. Little did the elders know that the apartment was situated only on a block from the parliament house. Governors and ministers of the kingdom, legislative members started to visit the cottage meeting out of curiosity. They came in in the morning before during the legislative sessions, again during lunch and in the afternoon. On August 7th, the new prime minister of Tonga, Tuahao, was one of the dignitaries who visited the elders' meetings. He was touched by the elders' message. Perhaps they were guided by the light of Christ. 
The premier was impressed by the power of their performance for these reasons. Number one, two elders preaching were dynamic and mature for their youthful appearance. Second, they were well versed in scriptural passages from the Bible. Thirdly, Smoot, Elder Smoot mastered the language and he taught the discussion in tongue. And lastly, Tukuaha was shocked at the young man's youth. Uh, mom, the young Mormon youth knew the cultural protocol and honored the chiefs with cover presentation as if they had thorough understanding of the culture. For five months later, Tukuaha could not contain the spirit of respect he had for the elders. He decided to ignore the pressure from without and assist the elders. He left the premier's office and escorted Elder Smoot and pleaded with his father, Tungi, the leader of the Wesleyan Church, to give portion of their land for the elders to lease. He later assisted the elders to organize the first earliest church in Tonga in 1891 and the first school in 1892 simply because his conscience urged him to do so. It was the same spirit that prompted his wife to rest their son, William Tungi, in the same school in 1854. This young boy of seven became the cons consort of Gonzalo de Bo III in 1917. Here we witness the eldest moment of exile and in, in, in a miracle. Today, the present king of Tonga, Tupou VI, is named after that great pioneer grandfather, Tupou After the king's son and the king's son, Prince Ata, was baptized a member of the earliest years here in Hawaii in 2015, no one in Tonga ever, even the royal family, thought that was possible. But with perseverance and sensitivity from the light of Christ, and all things are possible. From the humble beginning of these two American missionaries came great miracles and blessings simply because of the light of Christ. Tonga now has two LDS high schools, many middle schools, beautiful LDS chapels in every village in Tonga, and a beautiful temple. 50% of population in Tonga today is LDS. That means that Tonga has the highest percentage of Latter-day Saints in the world per capita. <clears throat> Let me conclude making this statement. Brothers and sisters, when you sit down your desktop computer, the first thing you usually reach for is the mouse. But the first thing that you should come to before saying your prayer is to pause and listen to the prompting of your conscience. For what is in your mind and in your heart, the Lord knows. <clears throat> the Lord knows before you voice them out. Your prayer then becomes a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with God. As you leave the comfort zone to venture beyond the reef, be prepared to listen with an open heart to others' opinions and perspectives with humility. Since humility is constructive, pride is destructive. Continue to cultivate your heart daily with gifts of the Spirit then you will hear the Lord's spirit, the Lord's will for you that it's day. I say this in the name of him whose sacrifice made it all possible for you and I, sons and daughters of God, to have equal share of God's light, the light of Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. Our dear, kind, loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this wonderful, beautiful day. We thank Thee, Father, for the gospel in our lives and for the atonement of our Savior. We are thankful, Father, for 
the answers to our prayers that we received during this devotional. And we ask you this time that may thy spirit abide in us so that our faith and hope in Christ will increase. We also ask you, dear Heavenly Father, that may thou help us become more sensitive to the promptings of thy spirit and to the light of Christ within us, that we may be able to make better decisions. We love thee, dear Heavenly Father, and these things we humbly pray in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>